What's up, y'all? It's Travis Tyler from Panadoc, and on today's episode, we're talking about patterns. And no, I am not talking about the goofy designs on the t-shirts I wear on the show. No, no, no. Instead, I'm talking about the repeated models that we find inside of our prospecting efforts, our customer data, and the co-marketing that brands get together to do. It's less sexy than what I'm wearing, I know, but it's a lot more rewarding, I promise. And that's because taking the time to stop, recognize, and catalog patterns requires us to be honest with ourselves about where we're succeeding and where we're failing, which is hard to do. Also, finding patterns takes intentionality. You have to really spend extra time and effort looking at all the details. In this episode, you'll hear from Jed Marley, Panadoc's global manager of outbound sales, on how he uses contact, account, and activity patterns to achieve 150 to 200% of his quota attainment. I think that's a big thing we're taught as SDRs or salespeople in general is don't look back, move on to the next one, which is a great mindset to have. However, you do need to take a step back sometimes, uh, be intentional, and like I said, look for those patterns. Also on this episode, I chat with the vivacious Carmen Zita about the patterns she's found and what makes the most successful co-branding efforts in the B2B, B2C, and SMB spaces. I actually saw that in a Ryan Reynolds movie the other day um, called Six Underground, where it was literally Ryan Reynolds on a plane with a Red Bull helmet. So anyway, uh, but their partnership. We always find a way to bring Ryan Reynolds back to this podcast. It's Is fine. this not the first time? I have strong feelings. But before we get into all of that, let's start with what marketers can and should be doing with user data patterns to increase their customer engagement. Look, if you're anything like me, you probably roll your eyes every time you hear a LinkedIn futurist say the phrase, data is the new oil. Because at this point, it's 2022, it's not a hot take. You need to discover interesting patterns inside of your user data, and that is gonna be what's really valuable to attracting and engaging with your audience. About nine months ago at Panadoc, our engagement marketing team got the idea from Grammarly to put together customer emails with personalized user data that communicated the value they are getting out of our tools. And look, if you're not familiar with Grammarly, that's okay. It's, it's a writing application that helps users improve their communication with AI-powered analysis and suggestions wherever you might be typing, whether it be Gmail, LinkedIn, Google Docs. Anyway, Grammarly over the last few years has done a great job of providing users with data on their app usage. Here's an example of a weekly writing update I got from them. It shows a few different stats on productivity, mastery, vocabulary, and total words checked over time. It's a cool reminder of how useful this tool is as part of my tech stack. Well, we wanted to mimic that here at Panadoc, and we have a lot of reporting. So a few years ago, our data science and analytics team developed a set of user data points based on how people use Panadoc and why they, de they decided to buy it in the first place. It boils down to 15 measurements into four different areas, workflow, insights, speed, and experience. These are great indicators of companies that effectively use Panadoc. They make more money and grow and our customer success managers use it to guide conversations around renewal time so that our customers understand what their investment is going towards inside of their business. So what does this have to do with patterns? Why should you care? Well, when it comes to effective customer engagement, we're trying to encourage and inspire you on this show to consider new ways so you can collect, analyze, and share relevant data patterns with your customers. So whether you're professional services, a SaaS company, whatever, there's plenty of opportunities for you to gather, and market customer data patterns to highlight your value. And if you're just listening to this podcast, you might wanna go check out the YouTube clip so you can see these examples with your own eyes. And I'll do my best to describe what our users get from us and why it's helpful for your marketing. Okay, here is our monthly email that goes to our account owners. At the very top, you'll see the number of sheets saved, which is a total number of pages inside your documents that you would have had to print. So it's a cool efficiency metric as well as an environmental data point, and it's useful for our customers to see. Next up, we have our speed metrics, which highlight the average time it takes your team to create and send a document, which is something we think is cool uh, to keep track of because over time, that number adds up to a lot of hours saved in a year, avoiding tedious bullshit tasks. Lastly, we have an adoption and leaderboard stats. It gives you a glimpse of how effective your team is using Pandadoc. When I asked the team that worked on this, like what were the interesting nuggets that they learned from? They told me that if you're going to try and do something like this at your own org, their number one tip was to find the key stakeholders inside of your company that have ownership of what you'll need to build this out. So for us, you know, 
we understood the complexity of getting the data and organizing it, that it was not going to be straightforward. So we had to talk to a lot of folks from the very beginning, especially in our brainstorming meetings. And so we invited folks from the product team, the data team, customer marketing, and email marketing. But it was a little bit of a struggle at first to understand what we were trying to do in a visually appealing way. So find yourself a solid agency as well that's going to specialize in the email tool that you're using. For us, that's HubSpot, but for you, it might be something different. Um, you just want to avoid somebody who doesn't understand front end design and development when it comes to coding things line by line and writing these emails in a way that's engaging and fun. So that was a really great tip from them. Another one was dedicate someone on your team to ensuring that the copy is on point. Otherwise, you did all of this heavy lifting of porting data into spreadsheets and uploading it for nothing. All right, that's all I've got for you on my end of the customer data patterns and marketing efforts. But if you'd like to learn more, please reach out to our team and I'll point you to the heroes uh, of this project, which include Masha Roshina, Nate Torvik, Nick Sensberg, uh, Chantel Thomas, Liz Turek, and Clark Conlin. They are the geniuses. They're kicking ass here at Panadoc and you can connect with them on LinkedIn. We'll take a quick break. When we come back, you'll hear from Jed about how he finds patterns every month to get more meetings booked. <laughs> Let's talk about finding patterns in your uh, prospecting outreach. So the reason why finding patterns is important as an SDR uh, is simply because of the Pareto principle. You've probably heard of it, the 80-20 rule. Um, and that states that 80% of your results are going to come from 20% of your activities, right? So what that means is that if you're an SDR and you can figure out um, what are those uh, kind of pockets of activities that I can be doing that are going to lead to a greater amount of results and then double down on that. Get rid of the fluff, get rid of the stuff that's not really driving results and just double down on the stuff that's actually making the most impact on me getting meetings or me having quality conversations. So um, finding patterns is really important for this reason. And uh, you know, when I was in SDR, my first three months in the role, I was just hammering the phones, not looking back, just going, 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 going. I think that's a big thing we're taught as SDRs or salespeople in general is don't look back, move on to the next one, which is a great mindset to have. However, you do need to take a step back sometimes, uh, be intentional, and like I said, look for those patterns. So one of the easiest ways to start finding these patterns and doubling down on those uh, you know, pockets of uh, activity that are going to lead to the most results is by creating a spreadsheet where you track every single opportunity you book and you ask yourself questions, three different types of questions. Questions related to the contact you booked. So what was the title of that prospect? Um, how long have they been in the role? Did they recently get promoted? Why did they take the meeting? Questions related to that person, that contact that you booked. Secondly, you're gonna to wanna to ask yourself on that spreadsheet questions around the account. So how big was the company? Uh, what industry or niche sub-industry was that prospect's company in? Uh, what tools or processes do they have in place? What critical events were happening at the company? For example, new funding, hiring, uh, a new executive. Um, what sort of like trigger events caused those people to take a meeting with you? And then the last thing is activity-related questions. How many touch points did it take you to book that meeting? What channel did you book the meeting on? Um, how many people did you have to multi-thread through? What sort of strategies did you use to book that meeting? Now, these are a lot of questions and you're going to put it on a spreadsheet. I recommend doing this once a week, once a month, where you look back at all the opportunities you, you booked and you just kind of answer these questions on a spreadsheet. It doesn't have to be perfect. The spreadsheet's just for you. But what you're going to start to find is patterns, right? You're going to start to see, hey, I'm actually booking a lot of meetings with people in marketing, but I'm not spending that much time calling them. Or, hey, like most of my meetings are actually coming from this sub niche. And sometimes the most obvious answers, you know, they're right in front of you the whole time, but you just need to put it on a spreadsheet to really see what it's all about. And uh, things that should have been obvious before become so obvious to you now that they're on a spreadsheet and in writing. And then you can just start testing those hypotheses, uh, hypotheses or whatever the hell you want to call it. Um, and that's really the goal of this, right? And, and so I'll give you an example of something that happened for me is I realized, hey, I was having a lot of success booking directors of sales operations that were in their first year in the role. So they recently changed jobs. And I'm like, I'm booking a lot of these people and I didn't even realize it. So I just doubled down on that. I pulled a whole list of just directors of sales operations who are new in their role. And I booked way more meetings than I originally would have booked with that number of prospects. And so that's just a small example. But if you just keep doing this and building on that month over month, you're going to get more and more efficient and just overall be more intentional with your prospecting. 
isn't Jed the best? I think what stands out to me the most was his dedication to keeping all his ops tracked in a spreadsheet and then asking himself these different questions about contact, account, and activity patterns. That's what's gonna help him and you go above average and just really take it up to another level when it comes to how you're doing your outreach uh, when it comes to prospecting. If you haven't checked out Jed and his blog, go check it out, jed.substack.com. You'll never miss another article and you won't regret it. All right, and then last up on this episode of the Customer Engagement Lab, I am going to be joined by Carmen Zita and we're gonna talk about co-marketing efforts and patterns she's found that have been successful. Carmen, what's up? How you doing? I'm doing great, Travis. How are you? I'm doing wonderful. I'm here in our uh, new studios, uh, Coastal Creative. Um, all right. This episode, we've been talking all about patterns, and I have been hyping up the audience about you talking to us about co-marketing and co-branding efforts and what patterns you found. So I think a good place to start, co-marketing. What the heck is it? My understanding is just two companies coming together to try to make money. You probably have a much better definition and understanding of it than I do. Thank you so much for leaving that responsibility to me. Um, <laughs> what a cop out. Anyway, so, no, well, so I mean, that's part of it, right? Like making yeah. more money is part of it, but co-marketing is basically two brands coming together, um, leveraging the fact that their audiences intersect, um, but their products don't compete, but they can create an opportunity to tell a shared story that can either, you know, bring a new audience to them from the person they're partnering with, or just create uh, just fresh excitement for their existing audience if it's someone that's already kind of purchasing both of those products, let's say. Beautiful, I think that makes sense to me. Now, we understand what it is. Can you give mm -hmm. us some examples? And some examples maybe you've seen in your life that other people might relate to and, and have a better understanding of as well. Yeah. So uh, one of my favorites, and if they ever took it off the menu, I would definitely write to my local congressman, is the partnership between Taco Bell and Doritos for the Doritos Loco Taco. Uh, that to me is, I mean, that's that's been on the menu, I think, now for years, which is just a testament to how amazingly beautiful that marriage was together. Like, if you're a Taco Bell fan, like I have been for most of my life, even after college, don't judge me. Once that came out and like, I got to have it. I was like, why wasn't this done sooner? Right? It almost was like so delicious. It was a no brainer. So yeah. if you haven't had that taco, highly recommended. Uh, so that's one example <laughs> that I absolutely love. I have a lot. I, I could, I can go deep on food examples. Okay. I can go real deep. <laughs> no, I think Doritos and Taco Bell partnering up to create the Doritos Locos taco is mm. not only giving me flashbacks to college uh, and eating those while intoxicated in my dorm room, mm -hmm. um, but a really good example of co-marketing and, and bringing together products in a co-marketing effort. So beautiful. What else do you have for us? Uh, GoPro and Red Bull, right? So we've all seen right those, those campaigns with someone in like some sort of crazy uh, airplane flipping around and they have the helmet on and they have the big Red Bull logo. I actually saw that in a Ryan Reynolds movie the other day um, called Six Underground where it was literally Ryan Reynolds on a plane with a Red Bull helmet. So anyway, uh, but they're We always find a way to bring Ryan Reynolds back to this podcast. It's fine. Is this not the first time? I have strong feelings. Um, <laughs> I have strong feelings. Uh, so that's another partnership, right? Uh, mm -hmm. That I think we're all become familiar with if you, you know, are alive in America. And then another partnership that's been going on since the early 2000s is Apple and Nike. So mm -hmm. they very often, especially after the launch, you know, they started working together, I think when the first iPod came out, and then that only increased once iPhone and the Apple Watch and all of those like tracking technologies for, um, for fitness came out. And that just to me is like a no brainer, right? That they would collaborate. And you've, you've I'm sure seen if you have an iPhone and you have an Apple Watch, the Nike app and how all those things integrate with it. So that's another great partnership um, that I wanted to highlight. So we've got Frito-Lay, Taco Bell, we've got Red Bull and GoPro, and then we've got um, the last one that I'm now blinking on. Apple and Nike. Apple and Nike. Right. What are the patterns that you've seen that make these partnerships so successful? 
So one pattern, like aside from them having those overlapping audiences, right, is their kind of brand personalities or the perception of their brands is pretty similar, right? So you think of Apple and Nike and they're like iconic, right? And they're like the top of the food chain in each of their categories. You think of um, Taco Bell and Doritos and that's stoner food. So like it makes, or drunk food, which is what I used to do. Um, Pick you know, your poison. Pick your poison, whatever it is. Uh, and then, you know, GoPro and Red Bull are both like edgy, extreme. You know, Red Bull gives you wings. GoPro is like, go, you know, I can't remember what it's called. Those crazy people that jump off mountains and then they open up like spider monkeys. So <laughs> I don't know what they're called either, but that was a perfect description. <laughs> you know exactly what I'm talking about. The um, human spider monkey. Yes. The human spider monkeys. Uh, so, yeah. So those if you think of those brands and you think of, you know, their their personalities and how you see them as a consumer, they're very aligned. So once you see them come together, it usually just kind of makes sense, right? So you have patterns of similar brand personas, personalities, and then an overlap as well in the patterns of the audience that make up those brands. Right. And notice, like, it's not just like, uh, you know, software company partnering with software company. You're talking about, like, a technology company like Apple with a clothing brand, right? Which you would think are completely different things, but they found a way to make it make sense. Gotcha. That makes sense. Now, not everybody that listens to this podcast <laughs> is going to be able to tap into um, the Pepsis, Coca-Colas, Frito-Lays, Apples, and Nikes of the world. What about small to medium-sized businesses? What kind of patterns and lessons can they take from co-marketing? And what advice do you have for them? I love this question because I actually have um, you know several friends with small businesses in South Florida that I will often give my marketing tips to. Um, so I love this topic. I feel like if you are a small business, one of the first things you should do is partner with other small businesses in your area, right? I think partnering with people near you, A, like you're in the same neighborhood. So your audience is probably going to be the same, right? And you're creating a sense of community. I think one of the strongest things you can do as a small business is even if you have a competing product, I'll give you an example, okay? Uh, there's a brewery boom down here in South Florida, and I know in St. Pete the same, and even though they're breweries, at least down here in South Florida, they're all buddies, right? They have events together, they don't really compete. I feel like in the small business world, it's not as taboo to work with a competitor, you know what I mean? Like, as long as you can differentiate yourself enough, I think, you can acknowledge that there's room for everyone to be successful when you're in the small business space. Yeah, right? it brings me back to a lesson I took in my only business class in college <laughs> and one of the only vocabulary words I remember, which is agglomeration. Mm -hmm. So you have a CVS on a corner and then you by proxy, a Walgreens is gonna set up shop right across the street from them because they have overlap in customers. Yeah, they're competing brands, but they're gonna be able to dip into each other's customer base. And when you think about it, like you said, with smaller businesses, um, it's not as uh, aggressive in the competition, right. right? It's about sharing in the abundance of that agglomeration effect. Right. Um, another thing I would do is, is there like a local artist or like a, like a pseudo local celebrity that has a little bit of clout, right? Is that person that's someone you can partner with? So if you have a brick and mortar and there's a local artist and they're pretty well known for doing murals, you know, can you offer up a wall on your building to do a mural, right? Promote their art, have that artist promote your products. That's another great way to do it. Um, in addition, any institutions like universities that you could partner with, like if you have a small clothing brand, can you do a limited series of co-branded, um, you know, limited edition shirts with that university on it and like a specialty design of whatever it is that makes your brand unique? Um, is there a cause from a bigger company that you can hop on, right? Because then that's not just co-marketing, that's cause marketing. And that's something that I'm personally really passionate about. So whenever you can do that, when you can pitch a creative way that you can take a cause to a next level, I think most people are just open to that kind of opportunity. And it takes away the 
we're just trying to make money aspect of it. You know, like I know it's weird to to reach out to a business, like say if you don't have a contact there, be like, hey, let's work together, let's do something. And the bigger business might be like, "Mm, they're just trying to like leverage our clout and make a little money, but what can they do for us? But I feel like if you're attaching that to a charity, kind of something bigger than both of you, that's a a really great win um, on all sides. I wanted to, and I know we're talking about small businesses right now, But really quickly, like in researching this topic, I wanted to bring up something that was super taboo, but I loved that they did it um, because people don't ever do it, but they did it because it was for a cause and it was bigger than than they were, um, which is a partnership that McDonald's actually did with Burger King. Did you hear about this? Bonnie? I know. I So your little head tilt, you were just like, what? And I was like, what? Um, <laughs> I did not hear about the partnership between okay. McDonald's and Burger King. No. I didn't know about it either until I started researching this ahead of the podcast. But it, would, it appears that 2019, Burger King and McDonald's uh, joined forces to basically support uh, one of McDonald's charities where they were donating, um, I think this was in Argentina. So for every Big Mac you purchased, they donated $2 to curing childhood cancer, right? So Burger King launched a campaign called A Day Without a Whopper, where they basically took the Whopper off the menu so they could encourage people to go buy the Big Mac at McDonald's in benefit of the charity. And I loved it. I I loved it so much because what an unlikely pairing. The the poster for it's also really cool. It's it's the the king holding hands with Ronald McDonald like in a close up. <laughs> I was That's an awesome so visual. it was such an awesome visual. Um and plus there's a whole thing about Burger King and the advertising they used to do with Crispin Porter that I'm a big fan of. So the fact that that's another day and another topic, but the fact that they did that with McDonald's, I thought that was incredible. I'm sure they were criticized for it, both brands for doing it, but it was it was bigger than them. And I think that's re- what go ahead. Yeah, no, I I think it's a really cool example that um, our audience can take from finding co-marketing in unlikely places. Yeah, I think it's just, you know, don't limit yourself. Don't limit yourself. Like, look at your business, look at what you offer, look at the people that you serve. I think going at it by looking at your audience and what are their potential interests? And then if you identify those interests, what are those brands that serve those interests? Right. And then start plugging in where you might be able to fit. That's that's kind of how I would approach it. Well, you heard it here, folks. Uh, Carmen now recommends that I go reach out to DocuSign, HelloSign, Proposify, <laughs> and get you. accept for a partnership. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I um, hate you so much. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in all seriousness, we actually have had um, our competitors come on the podcast. It's a really cool mm-hmm. way to reach across the aisle and make friends in unlikely places. And um, yeah, it was one of our most watched episodes. So I think this is a great wrap up. And I think if you have any final advice Um, Now is the time to give it when it comes to co-marketing, Carmen. I think it's about um, let's unify ourselves in the corporate world, even if it's a small business, because there's a lot of different things that divide us uh, in our current just like climate as a society, as human beings. So how wonderful would it be if we could just be more collaborative in our kind of day to day work life that takes up most of our time? It feels good, I think. It does. It does feel good. And I, I think, think that's it a does. good message. And I don't see it happening very often. Um, yeah. I'd like to see it more. So hopefully this inspires a few people. Um, Carmen, as always, we love having you on the show. Thank you so much for tuning in to this episode of the Customer Engagement Lab. And stay tuned for next week when we'll have a brand new episode. Thanks, y'all. Thanks, Travis. Thanks for listening to the Customer Engagement Lab brought to you by PandaDoc. If you liked what you heard, please subscribe to our YouTube channel or connect with us on LinkedIn. We love to hear from you and what you think of the show. 